right, thank you very much. Hello everyone, thank you for being here today. I'm sorry? Just say it. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here today at this, section about, uh, this session about KMM, your Swiss Army knife for kernel modules on Kubernetes. My name is Quentin, I work for uh, Red Hat, and unfortunately my co-speaker Hirsch Pathak cannot be here today. Um, he wasn't able to travel, uh, but I will cover his, uh, his section. Um, and indeed, let's, let's get into it. So uh, today we're going to talk about kernel modules, uh, specifically on, on Kubernetes. Um, so we'll start with an introduction about uh, what are kernel modules and why we do need them. Um, we are going to talk about the pain points that we might encounter uh, and how we can solve them with the, the KMM operator. Uh, we'll deep dive into the, the use case um, that we're going to look at today, which is enabling Intel GPUs um, in, in Kubernetes with, with KMM. Uh, and finally, we will have a, a great demo that will that will be all live, so that will hopefully work, uh, where we um, generate images from text using a GPU in Kubernetes that we enable with KMM. So uh, pretty exciting. At the end, we will have some time, hopefully, if I'm not too slow for um, for Q and A. Um, right, you might you might start by wondering uh, what are kernel modules and uh, why we do need them. Um, in, in, in Kubernetes, um, we're, we're all familiar, you know, what, but with what Kubernetes uh, is. It, if you have big clusters of machines and you have distributed workloads, then, then um, I guess you know what Kubernetes is. But uh, you know, what if we have uh, those kind of devices? So what if we have GPUs, uh, some kind of you know storage solutions in Kubernetes? Uh, what if you're using you know special NICs? Um, special AI accelerators, um, or, or, or maybe distributed file systems such as Luster. Um, the, the, the common point with all these uh, uh, devices and uh, you know uh, solutions is that they need all need a driver, and in the Linux world, a driver is powered by a kernel module. So, so what is a kernel module really? It's a piece of C code that extends the functionality of the kernel. Um, without having to reboot the system. So the point of uh, a kernel module is that it is modular and that you can load it and unload it at will. Uh, the, the, the most common use cases for kernel modules are indeed hardware drivers, um, virtual file systems, and you may also, uh, you, you can also add additional system calls to your system with, uh, with kernel modules, in fact. Um, what makes them a bit tricky to use is that they have to be built against a very specific kernel version, technically an ABI, but in most cases you need to rebuild your kernel module each time your kernel changes. And, uh, oh, sorry about that, I have no idea what that is. Okay, it's stubborn here, isn't it? All good, uh, all good. Um, and yeah, an another feature of kernel modules is that they need to be signed um, for secure boost systems, which means that you have a list of uh, public keys in your system, and your system, if it is secure boot enabled, will only accept kernel modules that are signed uh, with uh, a private key that matches uh, the, the database of public keys that you have um, on your BIOS, on your uh, UEFI. Um, all good, so yeah, basically uh, for some drivers and some file systems, we do need drivers. Um, Ideally, those drivers should be present in your kernel uh, and should be contributed upstream. And th the problem is that it's actually quite long for a hardware vendor or for a file system um, you know, writer that to actually contribute that kernel module into upstream. Um, you, you will go back and forth on the reviews. Uh, you have certain standards to, to match whenever you're contributing code into the kernel. So it's, it ends up being a, a lengthy process. Um, it's, it's not only about you know, contributing that, that code upstream, uh, we, also need, uh, to, to, well, we also need to resort to out of trick and then module sometimes to do A-B testing um, or to you know, enable the latest and greatest hardware uh, on, on systems. So upstream is, it, it is the best solution, but it takes time. Um, another pain point is that, that um, Another issue that we might run, a, run, run into when using kernel modules 
um, is that they're really built against a, a very specific kernel version. So uh, if any symbol in the kernel changes in the ABI changes, uh, then we have to rebuild the entire kernel modules. And even though we are guaranteed a, we are guaranteed a stable kernel, then we may at some point hit a CVE that will force us to change uh, the ABI. Right, and the, the last item I have here is um, those kernel modules not being part of your distribution or not being part of the upstream kernel, there is an issue of deploying actually those kernel modules on the nodes uh, and, and keeping those kernel modules up to date uh, with the kernels that we're running. Um, in Kubernetes, that is usually difficult because that means that you have to customize your nodes before they go into operation. So th the real question is here, uh, what if there was you know, a cloud native way of bringing those kernel modules on the nodes that are powering our Kubernetes cluster? Instead of re relying on out-of-band management for, the, for those kernel modules, uh, we would like to have something that is well integrated into Kubernetes and that allows us to manage the life cycle uh, of those K-mods. And, and for that, we actually developed KMM kernel module management. Um, so what is, what is the kernel module management operator? It's something that we wrote to bring a standard consumption model for kernel modules uh, in, uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, instead of you know, everybody, every, soft, every hardware vendor out there, every CSI um, writer uh, reinventing the wheel uh, over and over to, um, to deploy those kernel modules, we, we, we thought that we should have a, a common solution here. Um, kernel module management is a Signode project. We, we work with the Signode uh, in Kubernetes. It's an operator that builds, signs, and loads your kernel modules on your Kubernetes nodes. So what the operator does is that it monitors all the kernels running in your cluster and loads the right kernel module versions on the right nodes. Um, it, it doesn't only... Uh, it doesn't only load your kernel modules, it can also run your device plugin. Uh, and if you're a hardware vendor, that's uh, in general very useful. So uh, how do we make those kernel modules, which are really KO files, simple binary files, how do we make them cloud native and how do we integrate them into the workflow uh, of Kubernetes? Well, we actually wrap them inside container images. So in, within a standard container image, we actually put the KO files in, in a very well-specified uh, file system tree. Uh, and that is how we actually deploy um, the, 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 the K-mods on, on all the nodes. So th those K-mod images are really the vehicle that we use to bring those K-mods uh, to the nodes. Uh, the, the good thing about this, because you know a, a container image is a file system, then uh, one image can contain the K-mods for several kernels. So with only one image, you can address several kernel versions at once, and I will go into the details uh, later. Um, in addition to K-mod images, which is something that either the user or the, the, the hardware vendor or the CSI vendor uh, packages, uh, we, the kernel module management project brings the vo module CRD. So I, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Kubernetes, but a CRD is pretty much an object in the cluster that you use to configure certain aspects of the cluster. Uh, in our case, we map kernel versions running in the cluster with the name of a certain KMOD image. And that is how we say that with that kernel go um, those kernel modules, and this is how we actually load certain KMODs on certain nodes. Um, you, you can actually, I, I, w I will show you an, an example uh, module resource later, but uh, you can specify those uh, kernel versions you're compatible with uh, either with uh, you know literal strings or regular expressions. Like I said, you can accommodate many distros at once. Um, and within, within that module CRD, you actually specify if you want to build uh, your K-mods for certain kernel versions or not. So, so this is how really you uh, express the desired state of your kernel modules in the cluster. Um, the, the, the reconciliation loop is, is, is as follows. Um, you know, KMM determines that a certain node uh, needs some KMOD. It actually checks if the, the image that we configured for those KMOD exists. 
Um, if it does not, and we enable in cluster builds, then we are going to build the k-mods and build that image that contains the, the, the kernel modules. Um, if the, the, the secure boot image, which is the same image but with signed k-mods instead, um, if, if that doesn't exist, then we are going to reuse the image we built um, and sign the k-mods instead. Uh, and finally, we are going to, to, to run to load that k-mod and load the firmware files that our kernel module might need. So in a sense, this is, this is what, the, uh, what the reconciliation loop uh, looks like. Uh, all right, so uh, what I have here is uh, th really the simplest module CR that, CR that we could have. Um, like I said, I, I, I really stripped it down to have the interesting bits here. The interesting bits, uh, in my opinion, are the kernel mappings. Uh, so you can see that within just one module resource, you can actually address many kernels. And let's have a look at them. Do I have? I do have a pointer here. Yeah, this is working. All right, uh, l let's have a look at the first item here. Um, th this literal thing, uh, I mean, literal field here is pretty much saying that for this uh, Fedora 37 kernel here, we actually want to download that image, extract it on the node, and, and load the appropriate k-modes that are stored into that image. Uh, if we also have you know, any other Fedora 37 kernel, then we're actually going to use another uh, container image here, a container image being a k a, the name of a k-mod image that contains all the, all the kernel modules and driver the drivers that we need. Uh, finally, we have a selector here uh, that, that allows us to target only a subset of nodes uh, if we don't want to load that kernel module uh, on, all, on all nodes uh, of our cluster. Uh, I, I, in the previous example, I omitted how uh, I omitted the build section of the module. Uh, this, is, this is what it would look like. Um, th this uh, build is something that you can configure for some kernels only or for all kernels in your module resource. Um, what, it, what it basically does is that it references a, a Docker file that the user would have to put. Um, and then, like I said, the, the, it works as, follow, the, as follows. The operator would have a look at all the kernels available in the cluster. If uh, one of the, if, you know, it, for each kernel that is, that is in the cluster, if the, the corresponding image doesn't exist, then it would use that Docker file here um, create uh, a, a pod that will build the k-mod image, uh, and then you, you know that pod would build the the k-mod image with all the k-mods inside, uh, and it would then be deployed to all the nodes that that need it. Um, we I I also have the same for signing. Uh, signing would be you know like uh, like I said signing the ko files to be compatible with sec secure boot. Uh, it's also an optional section within the CRD. And you, can, you would specify here all the, the modules, uh, you know, the KO files um, that, that KMM needs to sign. I, I will not go into the details. What's, what's important to remember here is that the user provides the keys as Kubernetes secrets. And, and finally, I have, I have here a diagram that shows uh, how the whole thing would work. So uh, let's consider here a cluster with uh, six, n six nodes, uh, six nodes, I'm sorry. Uh, six nodes uh, and actually three different kernel versions. We have kernel 1, 2, 3 that's running on nodes 0, 1, and 3. We have kernel 4, 5, 6 which is running on nodes 2 and 5. And finally we have kernel 7, 8, 9. And let's consider an example where in our module resource we actually configure only two mappings. Uh, one is for kernel 1, 2, 3 and one is for kernel 4, 5, 6. So uh, this node will be excluded because let's say that we don't know how to build the k-mod for it. Okay, at the, at the very center of this, this whole diagram, we have the operator. The operator, like I said, is watching various resources in the cluster. Um, one of those resources is the module, the other one is the nodes. So it's building this internal map of what, kernel what kernels are running in my cluster and what modules do I have configured. Um, le we are considering a, a, um, a module that has integrated um, build uh, an integrated build section, so we have to read the Docker file to determine how we need to to build the k-mods. And um, once we have done that, we are actually going to create the build or the signing pod, depending on oh, depending on what we have to do. All right, and 
um, once we have done that, then uh, we have built all the kernel modules that we need. We have built the kmod image, which is the vehicle for those uh, kmods. Oh, I, I believe I need to speed up a bit. Uh, and then we are going to deploy all those pods running uh, that, that are going to actually load our kernel module. So this is, this is how it works. We are going to, to deploy all those pods here uh, for kernel 1, 2, 3, or same, same pods for kernel 4, 5, 6. For uh, node 4 here, we are not going to do anything. And finally, once we have the kernel module loaded on all the nodes, uh, then we can run the device plugin, which is actually going to communicate with the, 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 the kernel module inside the node and to expose the, the kernel module or any special resource it powers uh, to the API server, which makes the whole thing uh, consumable by uh, you know, applications. And one thing that is new in version 2.0 of KMM that was just released actually yesterday is that whenever we have loaded the KMod, then uh, the, the, the pods that are loading the, the module are actually disappearing. And on the nodes, we do still have the, the KMod loaded, but the, the loading pods are not there anymore, which saves a lot of resources. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go, I, I don't have time to go into all the features that, that KMM provides, but uh, something really helpful is that we are labeling the nodes whenever uh, wherever we have loaded the, the kernel module. So, so this, is, uh, this is, I believe, quite useful. Uh, we, we also copy the firmware files uh, from the kmod image, so the same vehicle for the kmods. Uh, we copy that on the node so that whenever you load your kernel module, uh, you might be able to, uh, uh, your kmod is able to load the firmware files it needs. Um, and then we have, yeah, like I said, we have a lot of features and I can go into details in the Q&A if needed. Um, right. Right. I think that, that that's it for the features. Uh, I will not talk about the, the use case from Intel. Um, Intel has been one of the early adopters of KMM uh, for their um, the dedicated GPU um, products in the data center. And I will explain, you know, like wh what's their problem statement and, and how they, they, they solve it with KMM. Um, it, it pretty much boils down to, um, to the pain points that I was explaining earlier. So um, the, the, the thing is, they, they, there is, so far there was no scalable and you know, standard approach of loading the KMods on Kubernetes. So whenever they release that uh, great GPU that they, the, 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 the Flex series that they have, um, there was no standard way of loading the appropriate drivers uh, on Kubernetes. So it's not only really about the, G the GPUs, but pretty much any XPU, any accelerator that you have out there. Um, like I said, the, the, the journey to upstream is very long. Um, there, there is a lag in downstream, and I'm not even talking about uh, the, the KMOD being available on OS distributions because each distribution does what they want with whatever version that they want to include. So it's, it's uh, it's quite hard to operate for an end user. The, the goal for them is uh, to shift left, you know, to have things uh, available as early as possible, uh, to be ready on day one, um, whenever they actually release the product. And so the, 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 I, I think, I believe the key point here is that KMM makes it easier for hardware vendors such as Intel um, to, uh, to accelerate the time to market. So uh, you can, you, you know, uh, as soon as you release the, drive, the, the device, uh, then you can make the driver available to, to users and load it dynamically on Kubernetes with KMM. Um, another use case that they have, and this is due to the very architecture of KMM, is that uh, because the, the operator watches, uh, watches all the kernels that we have in the cluster, um, it's, it's very easy to uh, rebuild the, the drivers and the KMOD image whenever we have a new kernel available in the cluster. Or it's also very easy to deploy a new module resource uh, in the cluster to try a new version of the driver. Um, and, and thanks to that very feature, they were actually able to um, deploy an in-house pipeline where they create their module resources and they add new nodes with the new kernels so that they pre-build actually each version uh, for each new version of their driver they actually pre-build the, the, the corresponding kmod image and so um, they, they don't have really to 
uh, hand out a module resource with the build instructions enabled um, as YAML. They can actually just give the module resource with, uh, you know, static, um, yes, yeah, st static kernel mappings pointing to images that already exist. And so that makes uh, that makes downloading those images faster, and you you don't need to build locally, in a sense. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. So uh, le le let's yeah let's have a look at the demo now. So hopefully it works. Like I said, it's all live, so um, I'm crossing fingers a little bit here. Um, so for this demo, uh, what we do have is a single don mini cube cluster. So it's effectively a Kubernetes cluster, but only one node. Um, it's really the latest and greatest CPU from Intel, but uh, what's interesting for us is this uh, GPU Flex 170 on, on their dev cloud. Um, so it's really their latest uh, uh, GPU driver for which there is no entry version. So uh, what we are going to do here is that we are going to create a Jupyter pod uh, with all the runtime li libraries that we need. So that's OpenVINO, which is a, an AI toolkit from Intel. Uh, we, in, in that pod, we also have installed the runtime libraries that you need to be able to use the GPU. Uh, and that pod uh, has 20 cores and 64 uh, gigabytes of RAM, which is already plenty. Um, in this demo, we are going to build an, the driver and load it with KMM. And finally, we, I will show you a, test, uh, a, a notebook, a Jupyter notebook that runs stable diffusion to generate images. Uh, the, the demo code is available on GitHub here, um, so you can, if you download the slides, you can click that. Uh, okay, let's have a look. So I'm, I'm connected to the machine here. Let's have a look at, uh, is that visible to everybody? Yeah, it's not, it's not too small. Uh, okay, we do not have any pod running, so let me create the Jupyter pod. Okay, so. Uh, don't pay attention to all the other resources. I'm fixing things with Minikube, okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect to the Jupyter Notebook. Password is OSS, that's really creative. Um, okay, it is loading. No thanks, no thanks. And I'm going to open the OSS uh, notebook here. Yes, that's the one. Okay, uh, let's have a look. Let, let, let's run the whole thing. So uh, let's run it step by step. So that's the height and the width of the image that we are going to generate. Um, we are going to download the pre-trained model um, from um, Hugging Face. Uh, so this is this is a model that's already compatible with um, Intel. Uh, open Vino. Okay, this should download the ah. All right, all right. We're done here. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to list all the devices that are available to us for inference. I have not loaded anything. I have not loaded my module resource, so it should only show. Yeah, it shows nothing. I915 is. Oh, sorry. I should probably put the. Uh, Presentation mode, yeah, makes things a little bigger. Um, I915 would be the, the name of the uh, Intel kernel module or the, the Intel driver for the GPU. Um, we use LSMod to, load, to list all the kernel modules uh, loaded on the node. It returns empty. There is no, uh, no Intel driver available. Okay. And, you know, OpenVINO, the, 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 the Intel toolkit for, for AI, uh, does return only CPU as an available device. So, so that's it. This is what we expect. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I said, this dropdown has only one option. We are going to compile for CPU then because that's the only thing that we can use. And we are going to try and generate still some images, see how long it takes. Okay. So we are now finally generating the image. Um, you can see that it's very long, actually. We have 20 CPU cores, the latest CPU available. Uh, it, it's still pretty long. It's going to take one and a half minutes uh, to generate the image. I think that's really too long. Um, I, I would actually kill it and reduce, you know, the number of steps here, maybe to 20. Uh, you know, the image will be ugly, but at least we will get something. 
still it's going to take some, some 30 seconds, um, 20, 25 seconds. Uh, and we, we, you know, we all know that GPUs are made for AI. If you try to do it on, on CPU, even if it's the fastest CPU, it, it takes a long time. Um, I still want to show you that, that it works, but it takes, it takes a very long time indeed. So right now we are, we are generating an image of the Tokyo Tower at sunset with stable diffusion, yeah. Uh, pretty good, but quite long to generate, right? And with some artifacts. So uh, this, this is all blurry here, and that is actually due to the fact that we reduced the, the number of inference steps to, to 20 from 50. Okay, so, so this is, yeah, this is pretty disappointing. This is quite slow, so let's actually load the kernel module. So what I'm going to do now, what, what I'm doing here is I am actually creating the module resource. Uh, I wanted to show you all the pods that are running. Okay, so uh, this is the Jupyter pod that I was connecting to. And uh, we actually created, oops, sorry. Uh, we created exactly that resource, which uh, should be familiar. It pretty much looks like the simplest module that I was showing you earlier. It has only one kernel mapping. Um, th this is an Ubuntu machine, so uh, we are matching this very kernel here, and we are telling KMM to build using a certain config map that is, that is available in the cluster. And this contains all the build instructions for our kernel module. So what KMM did is that it read this module as soon as, 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 soon as it was created in the cluster uh, and it tried to, uh, you know, fetch that image here that didn't exist. So what it's, going, what it's doing now it's, is that it's actually building it. Let's have a look at the build log. Okay, so you, you can see that we actually here, uh, if you've already uh, compiled kernel modules, this, sh this should look familiar. We actually compiled, yeah, all the components of the kernel module. Uh, we are now adding the firmware into the image. Um, th this, uh, this is a fast machine, so it's, it's only taking a couple minutes to uh, download everything and, and prepare the, the KMOD image. Uh, what we are doing now is, uh, yeah, we were just running depth mode, which is an, uh, an essential step. And yeah, we are preparing basically the KMOD image. We are going to push it to Quay.io. Uh, and once we are done, then the image will be available, um, will be available to KMM. So, so then what KMM is going to do is that it's going to create a worker pod, uh, a certain pod that is going to download that image, extract it in its file system, and then use mod probe to load into the system the modules that it contains. Um, this, this steps, this step here takes uh, maybe some 10 to 20 seconds. Right, 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 right. So uh, you can see that we actually pushed the image to, to Quay.io. Um, as soon as the image was available, then we had this worker pod running. Um, now it's going to download that image, extract it, and terminate already. Okay, so um, we built the image, pushed it, downloaded it on the worker pod, and hopefully loaded the kernel module. Let's go back. Uh, let's go back to our Jupyter Notebook. We are going, going to run all the steps again. Uh, I, actually, I believe I need to restart the... You know what? I will run until here. Exactly. So I'm going to uh, restart the kernel of the Jupyter Notebook and uh, run until that very step here. Okay, and you can see that the output changed here. Um, so instead of empty, we have uh, quite a number of kernel modules. And these are the kernel modules that our worker pod loaded after downloading the image. Okay, so now uh, OpenVINO reports that the GPU is available, uh, which is great. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to go step by step again. Okay, GPU here. Uh, we need to recompile uh, the pipeline, which should be pretty fast, right? We need to recompile it for GPU. Okay, this is, like I said, this is pretty fast. And we can now generate the images. So uh, we, we don't want an image of that quality here. Let's switch back to 50. So you remember that it took maybe some 30 seconds with, with GPU. Uh, so now we are using the GPU uh, and it's actually much faster, right? It uh, generates an image of a much better 
much higher quality uh, in just 12 seconds. And you will be able to judge by yourselves. It is much less blurry. I mean, the, okay, the, the Tokyo Tower is maybe a bit oversized uh, <laughs> compared to all the, the other buildings in Tokyo. Um, but I think the, the, the next one will be a lot more realistic. This, for this one, we are uh, generating an image of uh, a temple in Japan uh, at fall. Um, and let's see, uh, again, it's, it, it's really, really much faster compared, compared to CPU in 12 seconds. Only you have an image like this, which is pretty believable if you ask me. Uh, I kind of like it. Um, and finally, we, I, I mean, we have to have Fujisan here. Uh, so right now we are generating uh, an image of a lake and Mount Fuji. Again, the same settings, uh, the same image size uh, and uh, 50 steps for uh, inference. And here it is. I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Uh, however, I'm not sure what is this mountain here, uh, but don't ask me. <laughs> the, the rest is pretty good, I think. Um, I, st I still have some, I don't really have some minutes. I would show you that if we delete the resource, uh, we can actually unload the kernel module from the node, which is useful if you want to unload a, a certain version and load a newer version of the driver. But uh, you'll have to trust me on this, it works. All right, going back to the slides. Is this working? Uh, I wanted to say a few words about uh, kernel module management on OpenShift. Um, we actually have a, a, a special version, um, I mean a dedicated version of KMM on OpenShift. It has uh, all the good features of the upstream version plus uh, uh, much, uh, much better security. It actually supports the security context constraints uh, objects uh, of Red Hat OpenShift, which really makes it an enterprise product. Um, we also solved a, a fairly difficult problem, which is uh, how do we uh, get all the libraries, the headers, the compilers required to build a K-mod for a certain version. Um, so we actually have that with driver toolkit, which is a component of, of OpenShift. It's a base image for your, uh, the kernel version that ships with your OpenShift and it contains everything that you need to build a, a, a driver. It's really great. Uh, finally, OpenShift, uh, you know, ships with an in-cluster registry, uh, which is an image registry in your cluster. And it's really useful if you want to run in-cluster builds, uh, which you often do. Um, it has, obviously it's compatible with all the other OpenShift enterprise features that, you know, the CA management, the proxy, uh, the registry settings, it's, it's all in integrated in the, in the downstream edition of KMM. Um, wrapping up, um, KMM is indeed a Kubernetes operator that loads kernel modules on node. We actually tried to uh, make it, the, you know, the standard consumption model for KMods um, on Kubernetes. Uh, it, it can build your K-mods, it can sign them if you want to use Secure Boot. Uh, and with our flexible API, uh, you can actually target multiple... Apologies. Trying to sync my agenda, I don't know why. This is, um, yeah, we, we are, uh, the, the flexible API that we have in the module CRD makes it easy for you to target multiple kernels and even multiple distros uh, at once. So if you're a hardware vendor, you could just craft a module resource uh, and provide it to your customers and, and that, you know, whatever distro they're running, uh, you could make it work. Uh, because we label the nodes whenever the certain K-modes are loaded, then it makes it very easy to consume nodes that have the kernel module or the driver loaded. Um, KMM is also available on OpenShift with a dedicated version. It's all, uh, it, it has all those nice enterprise features. Uh, and like I said, we released version 2.0.0 yesterday, actually. So it's all ready to, to use. Um, you can reach us on the Kubernetes Slack on that channel. Uh, this link will take, you, will take you to the nice documentation website that we have. The, the repo is here. And then also uh, a few links about OpenShift. It's all in the OpenShift docs, obviously. We have a dedicated repo for it. Uh, and the, 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 the two links at the bottom are from Intel and the, the solution that they built on top of KMM. Uh, to enable their GPUs. I think that's it for me. That's it. Thank you. Any question?
So in the session you said um, a, let's say open source version, not open shift. Um, the kernel module, if it's not available, uh, is expected to build in the build phase uh, with the provided config map that has the Docker file. Uh, but how do you actually manage the Docker file itself? Is it like, because, like how do you, detect a new version of the kernel module is provided or like, um, like I, I'm not sure like what's actually inside of the Docker file itself. Is it on? Yes, it's on, so I can. Um, okay, so you're asking, let's say I have a new version of the kernel module that I would like to build. Is that is that what you're asking? Yeah, like um, you, you were talking about the like the Linux kernel version mm -hmm. and also the device plugin version which is, I understood, but like um, kernel module also has like a different versioning system as well. Right. So if you want to release like a, or adapt, maybe like a, let's say like a git, git pull from like the main branch, mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. it has a different life cycle. Right. Right? Like, right. So yeah, my question is the building phase itself has a, an, a different dependency. Mm -hmm. So. I was asking about the dependency. Okay, okay. So, uh, so obviously, in that in that slide uh, right here, this is this is the simplest kernel module. Yeah. Uh, it has many more fields uh, for you to configure. There is um, most notably a version uh, field that you can add, and that will describe the version of your kernel module, and you could increment that. Um, okay. And and then. Um, yeah, it's all available on our, on our documentation online, but then what it's going to do is it's going to look for nodes that have a specific version label. Okay. Because you would want certain, some of your nodes to run a certain version of the K-mod and some other nodes to run the newer version, for example. Yeah. Uh, and then that version field uh, will be made available at the build step. So in your build script or in your build uh, Docker file, you could have an if based on that. If version three, if version four. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, how do you, uh, like, do you, do you care about the build cache? Um, yeah, the build. So yeah, you, you we adapted Canico, right? Uh, it, uh, the, the upstream version uses just Canico. Plain Canico, we mount the Docker file in it. Yeah, Canico can integrate with like container, no, I mean like, um, uh, like Amazon S3 or object storages right. for their uh, the image build cache. And uh, there are other like a build kit also, uh, it can use the, like any type of, uh, like it can be object storage or it can be a uh, plain file system. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. There are many uh, potentials uh, because building a kernel module is not a short time job. It can take some time depending on the device. Depending on the device, like yeah. for the Intel GPU driver, it yeah. took a couple of minutes, but it can be much longer, I agree. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty sure in the realistic use case, uh, people want to utilize the, the you know, intermediate cache layer. Mm -hmm. layer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, there, there are many uh, actually caching options in Canico. Uh, I don't think we leverage any of those at the moment because to be honest, uh, you don't rebuild the, the kernel module that often or at yeah. least in the use cases that we've seen. Okay. Um, but but let, let's talk about it. You know, we have a monthly community meeting uh, if you want to join that and if, if that's really a concern for you, we would be really happy to talk about it. Okay. Absolutely, thank you. Any other question? Please. Uh, thank you for a good uh, pre presentation. Uh, if my memory is right, uh, the uh, two, two pods were created after you applied this uh, mo module YAML. One, maybe one is a build, build of pods, and uh, maybe other one is a, low, a pod which load kernel module. Mm, mm, if my memory is right, the, the pod which loads the uh, kernel module was terminated. Yes. So my question is, uh, what happens if the node 
was reboot, is rebooted, how、um, uh, will the kernel module be loaded automatically, or should we need something manually? Thank you for, for the question.、Um, this, this is actually very different in the V2 that, that got released. In V1, we were creating a daemon set、um, per kernel version that was running in the system.、Uh, and that would mean that we would load the kernel module and then the pod would keep running until it's terminated. And whenever the node reboots, then the daemon set recreates the pod on the node and reloads the kernel module, blah, blah, blah. You get it. Um, in, in V2, we actually、uh, store the, the, the state in some other resource that I've hidden from you in the demo.、Um, but the point is, we monitor the, the ready condition of the node. And there is a, a timestamp associated to that condition. And we actually,、um, th the short answer is、uh, we, we record the last time we loaded the kernel module. And if it's longer than the last time you rebooted your node, then we, we will create a new worker pod that will reload the kernel module. So the short answer is whenever you reboot the node, yes, we will reload the kernel module. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think that's it. Yes, we're, we're really past the time.、Uh, thank you very much for attending this presentation.、Um, I will be available at the Red Hat booth、uh, if you have more questions about KMM, upstream or downstream. Thank you all very much.